San Diego honors its veterans with a big parade downtown. Some veterans are marking the day south of the border after being deported. Some of them describe it as being banished from the country that they serve. I'm Eric Anderson. We'll have those stories and the latest word from the Secretary of Defense about what's next for the U.S. in Afghanistan. And I'm Amitha Sharma. As we remember those who went to war, we talk with a soldier who writes about waging peace. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by... Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Dwayne Brown is off tonight. The White House could soon announce a plan for U.S. presence in Afghanistan once the combat mission there ends in 2014. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta says several options have been developed and a decision is expected in the next few weeks. Once that happens, U.S. officials have said they'll set a timetable for withdrawing the roughly 67,000 U.S. troops who are still stationed there. San Diego County has about 247,000 veterans, and today they were honored with a parade down Pacific Highway. We get a look through the lens of KPBS photographer Christopher Maui. One, two, three, four, and more. I am a Vietnam veteran. I was on submarine service. My father was a 30-year submarine veteran, a war hero, and he deserved every bit of recognition he could get for what he did for the country. My dad was a veteran. My brother's a veteran. I have a sister and a brother that are chiefs in the Navy right now. Our whole family's been in the military, so it's uh, coming out here to support the veterans and the, and the high school band. We need to... Uh, you know, just show them that we care. Now that's a lot. It's important. By being here, we're participating in that and showing them that, uh, you know, that they're being thought of. I got drafted in March of 41 and got out in October of 45, and the only battle I was in was Pearl Harbor. God was looking out for us, and boy, he must have been because... I mean, they came in and they were really blasting everything in sight. Every year, things come back that you figure you've forgotten that happened that day. You just think of the fellows that were wounded and those were killed, some of them your buddies. You never really forget and you never want to remember. I just wish them well. I wish them happiness. And, uh, and I just want everybody to know that we think about them, you know, that they're not missed. They were still here for him. Thank you, you know. Thank you for being there when we needed you, and thank you to all the ones that are there now. God bless you all. Thanks for everything you do. Thank you for your service. Some veterans are marking the day in Mexico. After their military service, they were deported for committing crimes in the U.S. From our Fronteras desk, Aaron Siegel talks to some of those veterans living near Tijuana. Hector Barajas now lives in a rundown apartment in Rosarito, Mexico. He grew up in Compton, California, and served for seven years in the Army. He thought that his military service would lead to full-fledged citizenship. I was a legal resident when I entered the military in 1995, uh, re-enlisted in 99, got out in 2001, I had two honorable discharges. I was under the impression that I was a U.S. citizen be automatically because of the recruiters, but that wasn't the case. Although military service can speed up the process of becoming a citizen, it's by no means automatic. Barajas got into trouble after leaving the military. He served a three-year sentence in prison for discharging a firearm into a vehicle. He faced mandatory deportation, just like any other non-citizen. Barajas was brought across the border and dropped off in Tijuana. The 
report of entrance house on my officer men. His rough apartment now serves as a drop-in shelter for a rotating cast of deported vets, as well as the headquarters of their makeshift organization, Banished Veterans. Hey, what's up, it's man? a cramped space inside a tiny complex, tucked behind a chain-link fence. From floor to ceiling, the walls are covered with posters and notes, whiteboards with names and phone numbers. I, I'm doing what somebody did for me when I first got here. And, you know, we're supposed to take care of our, you know, you leave no man behind. So I'm a firm believer in taking care of these guys to the best of our abilities because this is a small apartment. Fabian Rebolledo is a recent arrival. He's a Kosovo combat vet and a former paratrooper. He arrived just four months ago after 24 years in Los Angeles. My deportation was uh, due to a uh, violation of probation due to a uh, unsufficient funds check, $750. Like Barajas, Rebolledo thought that military service would protect him. I was a little resident, and actually uh, I joined the military because I wanted to become a citizen. I was going to be the first uh, member of my family to become a citizen. But before the bad check, Rebolledo had two DUI convictions. All of his crimes were nonviolent. They were still enough to ban him from the U.S. for the rest of his life. That's because of a 1996 immigration law that expanded the list of crimes considered to be aggravated felonies. The law even made some misdemeanor crimes result in permanent mandatory deportation for non-citizens. Barajas and advocates would like to see some judicial discretion come into play in these cases, taking military service into account. But right now, that's not happening. So, from the band vet headquarters in his Rosarito apartment, Barajas has been trying to keep track of the numbers. When I started doing this, uh, I started making just a, a list, just you know, just for the hell of it, and then uh, it started growing into something that people want to know because Homeland Security is not doing it. So um, I have 103 names already on my list to put to different countries around the world. Um, also, right here in Tijuana, Rosarito, I'm looking at anywhere from 500 to 1,000 deported veterans. There's no way to confirm those numbers. Immigration and Customs Enforcement says they don't track deported veterans. Barajas is searching for other deported vets and trying to rally them and others. It's a lot like amateur detective work. He makes phone calls, uh, follows leads, sends Facebook requests, and tracks social media. What we basically do, we're doing what the Veterans Administration is not doing, what the government, U.S. government is not doing. Uh, so we're keeping tabs on these guys just for our purposes and for just, you know, just to make sure that we can somehow maybe facilitate them. Vets who commit crimes, do time, and are then deported can still be eligible for benefits, but it's impossible for them to collect most of them. But there is one benefit they can and do collect, burial. We're eligible to be buried as U.S. citizens when we die. We had a guy that died about four months ago. He was deported, was not let, he was not allowed to go back to the U.S. When he, went, when he died, then they let his body go. And then they give him a nice plaque saying, or certificate, thank you for serving our country. So when I die, I, I have a life deportation, then I can be burdened as, as an American. It's true. Unless they've been dishonorably discharged, the VA says all military veterans are entitled to burial in a national cemetery with a marker and a flag. Few are more qualified to speak of peace than a soldier. After all, he's the one who's seen the horrors of war firsthand. Tonight, we have one such man, Army captain and author of four books on war and peace, Paul Chappelle. Paul, thank you for being with us today. We were speaking off camera just a couple of minutes ago, and you said that your thoughts about peace go back several years, and yet you graduated from West Point. You joined the military, joined the Iraq War, rose to captain. Why did you join the military? Well, I think a lot of people join the military thinking they're fighting for peace, thinking that they're working and striving for peace. If you listen to President Obama, President Bush, any American president, they all say that American soldiers are fighting for peace, fighting for freedom, fighting for democracy, fighting against terrorism or communism or some sort of evil threat. And General MacArthur said that the soldier above all other people prays for peace, for he must suffer and bear the deepest wounds and scars of war. So I think many people join the military wanting to do good in the world, wanting to make the world safer and more peaceful. 
You've written two books, or actually four books, and two of them are titled Will War Ever End and The Art of Waging Peace. How does peace get waged between countries who have deep disputes over religious animosity, competition for resources, past transgressions? Is that possible? Yeah, I think it is possible. I think a good example would be Europe. Europe was the bloodiest place on earth for around 500 years. Constant warfare, a lot of that was religious conflict, culminating in two world wars. But now it's very hard to imagine a war in Western Europe. It's very hard to imagine France and Germany going to war with each other. And Europe was the bloodiest place on earth for centuries. And if a place as bloody as Europe, as divided by religious conflict as Europe could become peaceful, it gives a lot of potential for other places to possibly become peaceful. I think another very protracted conflict is African Americans in the United States. I'm half Korean, a quarter white and a quarter black. My father was half white and half black. And African Americans lived under over 300 years of slavery and segregation and lynching. If you look at Birmingham, between 1957 and 1963, in Birmingham alone, 18 black homes and churches were bombed. And today, African Americans aren't trying to take revenge because there was a peaceful resolution through the civil rights movement that was able to give them equality and kind of create the conditions for forgiveness. So I think that if you look at the centuries of conflict between African Americans being brutalized, if you look at how violent Europe was, it does offer the potential for other places on earth to also become peaceful. Now, as you know, there have been efforts made throughout history to end conflict. Most recently, you had the League of Nations after World War I, and yet it failed to stop Nazism and fascism. You're the director of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Is there something different about our current era that might be more ripe for peace? I think there are some different conditions now. One condition now is that ending war now is really an issue of human survival. Because of nuclear weapons and the threat of nuclear annihilation, ending war has become an issue of human survival. And if we do not find a way to resolve conflict peacefully, the human race won't survive. But we've had a couple of wars uh, since the, the nuclear age dawned, and yet that hasn't stopped those wars from happening. And I think that is a big myth. I think there is a myth that if you have nuclear armed nations, that war will end. We, if you look at, for example, our own foreign policy, we talk about how nuclear weapons work as a deterrent. But what actually happens is if you have nuclear armed nations, they engage in proxy wars. If you look at the Vietnam War, if you look at the Afghans fighting the Soviets, which we armed the Afghans. And I think that is a big myth that nuclear weapons create peace. When we have had nuclear armed nations and war continues, which means we have to look deeper at the issues and solve war from its underlying root. I think most people think that human beings are simply predisposed to war, that there's something inherently violent about about our nature. What are your thoughts on this? I think if you look at military history, and I know this is controversial, I'm going to say, if you look at military history, the evidence that we're not naturally violent is so overwhelming. Just to offer a little bit of evidence, and I go a lot more in depth in the talk this evening, but one piece of evidence is war traumatizes the human brain. We know that war traumatizes the human brain, and even the advocates of war will say that war is hell. But if human beings are naturally violent, why would war traumatize the human brain? If we were naturally violent, why wouldn't people go to war and become more mentally healthy? Another a quick piece of evidence is the greatest problem of every army in world history is when a battle begins, how do you stop soldiers from running away? If you look at our fight or flight response, our flight response is far more powerful than our fight response. Most people, if I run at them with a machete, are going to be freaked out and they're going to run. And the way the armies get people to fight is through the camaraderie and the brotherhood and fighting to protect your loved ones and your family and your comrades. In five seconds, um, how have your former fellow servicemen received your books? I think that my priorities are national security. I think that nonviolent struggle and nonviolent methods are essential for national security. And I think that um, so far what I've seen has been mostly positive. And we have to close it there. Paul Chappelle, thank you so much for speaking no, to us today. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Now, some of the Marines who saw action during the Vietnam War carried cameras instead of guns. Their mission, to cover the 10,000 Marines hunkered down between North and South Vietnam in 1968. Dwayne Brown introduces us to the man in charge of 32 photographers who documented a year-long battle. I've had a career that, that no one could touch. I'll, there is no way anyone could experience the things that I've, I've gone through. Retired Marine Corps Captain Joe Hurd spent 30 years in the service and has the pictures to prove it. 
He was the commanding photo officer of the 3rd Marine Division from Camp Pendleton. Her tears up when recalling the picture of an 18-year-old volunteer who probably spent 90 days in boot camp before ending up in Vietnam in 1968. I don't think he looks 16. That's the reason that picture was shot. Hurt says the expression on his face tells the story of what it was all about. All of a sudden, you come from a high school or a, or a college, and there you are, where you're going to, you won't even have a bed to sleep on tonight, a cot maybe, a sleeping bag maybe, and you're going to spend 14 months in that environment. It's rough. Hurt and his group of photographers captured the daily life of the 10,000 Marines deployed to Vietnam. He says they hunkered down at the crossroads between North and South Vietnam. Quezon was quite a battle. And that's and, what these pictures depict? Yes, yes. They show the actual situation in which men have to live uh, and in some case die. Two of the men in this Vietnam photographer's picture gave their lives trying to capture the moment. A painful memory for Heard who says all of them were devoted to the mission. They're fantastic. They, we looked like a bunch of men had just been drug out of the sewer, but we really, we were there doing the job, and that's what it's all about. Heard donated 39 of his photos to the Veterans Village San Diego, an organization formed by Vietnam veterans 25 years ago. CEO Phil Landis hung this picture of a grizzled Marine in his office. It just resonates so much. If you've been in combat, especially in the Vietnam War, and you're of that era, you see that photograph, I mean, that's like there, because that's the look. And I saw it, and I said, that not only is it the look that I remember from so many years ago, but it's also the look of our combat veterans that join us here at VVSD. That's what's inside every post-9-11 veteran that's here that serve in Iraq and Afghanistan. And when people come into this room, I want them to be able to look at that, because that's the face of our resident. Heard says the photographers were the last to know, but first to go on the battlefield. This operation takes place in an hour, get your gear, boom, you're gone. They're the last to know, but they're the first to go off of that plane if it, if it comes to that. And these photos were given to VVSD to remind the younger generations what their fathers, grandfathers, and uncles endured. Today, he says his wife Jody is in charge as they pose with this self-portrait also donated to the village. Heard says that many of his photos ended up in the Marine Corps archives in Washington, D.C. Rising home prices are usually seen as good news for the economy, but the California Association of Realtors says homes are becoming less affordable. Its latest quarterly index shows a two-point drop in the percentage of Californians who can afford to buy a home, from 51 to 49 percent. The biggest changes were in Los Angeles and the San Francisco Bay Area. San Diego's numbers stayed steady. The Poway Unified School District is usually accepting accolades for its academic accomplishments, but these days, Poway Superintendent John Collins is answering a lot of questions about money. We reported earlier this month the district is able to raise millions of dollars in extra taxes to pay for new schools, even computer equipment, without a public vote. The tax is called a Melarus, and it raised an extra $40 million for Poway last year. I News Source reporter Kevin Crow sat down with Collins to ask him about the fairness of that tax. In talking about Melrose, uh, you have homeowners in your district who pay as much as $800 or even $1,000 in extra taxes every month to pay for new schools, and buses, and even computer equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, is this a fair way to fund a public school? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I have to take exception with um, what I've seen um, said. In, in different places about it is a non-voter approved tax. Um, that gives a perception that we impose a tax on people who are living in those homes without their approval. That's absolutely false. Uh, it is a voter approved tax. It's approved by the owners of the land when we enter into the mitigation agreement. They do vote, albeit a few people who own the land are the ones that vote. But the people who live in those homes vote when they sign the contract to purchase the home. That is very clear. They know what they're paying. They agree to that. Um, that's their vote. I want to buy that home, and I'm willing to pay that. And that's true for anybody who comes in and buys the home second 
second tier. They know what the fees are, and they agree to that. And I've seen some of the comments from our parents that were in your report that they think it's absolutely uh, worth and a fair way to provide great schools for their kids. Mm -hmm. And the majority of districts quite literally have to beg homeowners to raise their taxes by a few hundred dollars a year to meet basic needs. Uh, your schools arguably are kind of state-of-the-art, uh, fully equipped in part because of Melrose. So take Del Sur Elementary, for example, a very nice school. What role did developers play in designing that school? They were at the table when we were doing the design. They had some input into the physical look of the building we worked with. We did that in, um, in Poway when we rebuilt Midland. We sat down with the city of Poway. They were, re they were redeveloping Midland Road in the theme of Old Poway. And yes, they had a voice and we listened. And if you see that school, you'll see not only does it fit into that motif, but it really drove uh, what's going on on Midland Road in terms of the old Poway look. And we do that whenever we build a school. Those who um, at that point are paying for it have a voice in what it looks like, as do the parents, and as to what, what should be in that school. But most importantly is we ensure that the schools that are being built meet our standards and that the kids going to those schools will have the same facilities, the same thing that the kids in the rest of the district have. Now, is there a conflict of interest uh, in terms of developers having a say in how nice a school there is? Because the nicer the school, the easier it is to sell a house. No, I don't think so. And I don't think so because it's not that the developer is in charge. We, we negotiate mitigation agreements. We have a say in that. And, and we're able to control that conversation just as much, if not, well, actually, more so than the developer. We don't have to enter into that agreement either. Uh, they want the agreement, and so do we. And we think it's the right way to fund schools. But neither of us is required to enter into that agreement. The default is we can require them to pay developer fees. So we have control as well. And who's the person looking out for the taxpayer who says maybe we don't need a swimming pool in that school or maybe we don't need smart boards or those kinds of things when you're building really nice schools. The taxpayers who choose to move into that neighborhood get to decide that. They don't have to move into that neighborhood. They choose to move into a neighborhood that has a good facility and they're willing to pay the taxes that have, that have been set on that. The taxpayers are the ones who are deciding that. You've also gotten some attention uh, for your compensation and we're also a little bit on the hot seat for the bond, for the capital appreciation mm -hmm. bond. Uh, that's going to end up costing taxpayers millions more in the long run. And now a little bit of Melrose. What do you make of the spotlight on you and the way that the district raises money? Well, I think it's, it's a little bit unfortunate. I think there are those who think that because Poway is a successful district and that we have gotten a lot of accolades for the good things we do for kids, that we're, that we're a great target, that let, let's, you know, let's find something on Poway. Um, Poway has done nothing different than every other district in the state of California. The whole issue on the, on the um, SFID bonds, on the, on the payback of the, of the capital appreciation bonds, there are thousands of those that have been issued by school districts, and many with m much worse deals than the one we got. Um, all that to say, um, that was all, I believe, still taken out of context. Um, we were talking about one issuance in a full program. And uh, I can't think of a program where you can't find something that you can pull out of context and say, oh, look how awful that is. You put it back in the context of the full thing. Um, we make no excuses for the Building for Success program. We have 22,000 kids in those 24 older schools just to address the very problem that you, that you were asking me. Well, what about the old schools? You build these new schools, what about those? We take care of them. Our community takes care of them. Our voters take care of them. I haven't received uh, huge uh, complaints from voters who are in those schools or even those who don't have kids in school. There was a media article that drew all kinds of attention taking one piece of that deal out of context. Chargers head coach Norv Turner says he is sticking with quarterback Philip Rivers despite a season of struggles. Rivers has had 40 turnovers in 25 games, the latest in a 34-24 loss to Tampa Bay. The Chargers go to Denver next weekend. A little bit of March Madness is headed here next year. San Diego State University will be hosting some of the early round games of the NCAA basketball tournament. This will be the third time that the tournament has come to the Mesa at SDSU. 
Temperatures are going to warm up a bit around San Diego tomorrow. Then we're in for another cool down for the rest of the week. Here's a look at the forecast. The painful fallout from war affects veterans and their families for years after the conflict officially ends. Peace-minded people throughout history have urged alternatives to combat, but they've mostly failed to stop religious and territorial aggression, not to mention fascism and Nazism. With Veterans Day upon us, we want to know what your thoughts are. Is world peace possible or are humans doomed to violence by their very nature? Many of you thought the latter. Kyle Trambley wrote, quote, violence is inherent in our nature. That is the function of society, though, to form a contract to create a set of rules designed to discourage behavior harmful to the herd. Where we see the worst systematic violence, excluding serial killers and lone murderers, we see a breakdown in social contract that deters violence, religious extremism, genocide, etc. Until we have a uniform social contract, we are doomed to self-destruction. Carl Flores had this to say, humans are inherently prejudicial towards things that are unfamiliar. This includes other humans, culture, food, religion, music, ethnic diversity, and the Klingons. We have been and always shall be our worst enemy. You can weigh in on the conversation by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and of course, you can email us. You can find tonight's stories online at kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us and have a great evening.